Hey everybody, welcome to the Muslim Intelligence q and I'm sitting here with the amazing, the wonderful Ashley Van Houten. Ash, I miss you, sis. How you doing? I know, I miss you too. And we just, we literally exactly missed each other in New York. I'm here right now. You were just here, like, having lots of adventures. And we literally were like ships in the night. So I'm kind of sad about that, but... You know. Yeah, as I said, super packed schedule. I had this amazing opportunity to train twice with Don Saladino, who's a very good friend of mine out of New York. Brilliant, brilliant trainer and just an amazing, wonderful human being. Anybody who lives in New York, go check out Drive 495. Again, I don't even know if you can train there, but private gym, uh, super exclusive, but awesome environment, awesome energy. And Don's just an amazing human. Got to hang out with uh, one of my awesome clients who's a very successful entrepreneur. And I got to go to Belcampo twice. It's ironic how this happened. So last week, you know, I was in LA, I went to Belcampo for the first time with Dr. Huberman and who, you know, obviously I don't know how much we've talked about it, but just is the most amazing, amazing, brilliant guy who's a guest on the podcast in the past. And if anyone hasn't listened to that podcast and is listening to this one, I suggest you, as soon as you're done with this one, head over and use and read that one. It was just a few episodes ago, Dr. Andrew Huberman, incredible food and super great service. And, you know, ironically, so I'm in, in New York Monday, Tuesday this week and walking. Ironically, we're like, hey, we're going to go into the guy who I was with. It's like, hey, man, I need to go across the road to the mall for a minute. And I was like, sure, man, I'll, I'll scoot over with you. And I see Belcampo. And I had just been telling him about my amazing experience at Belcampo. We see a picture of it on the wall or we see like a, an advertisement for it. I'm like, oh, wow, they, maybe they have one opening here in this mall soon. And and turns out they already had one there. So yeah, we got to enjoy that twice and just such great, incredible food. And knowing that you can eat high quality, sustainable, moral food in a mall in New York is awesome, right? Most restaurants you go to, you're like, uh, you know, it's just quote unquote grass fed, but it's probably grass fed off the side of the highway somewhere in, in California. And they're drinking, you know, sewer water off the freeway or breathing emissions. And this place is literally 60,000 acres in Northern California, or maybe it's Oregon. And just like this amazing, if anyone checks out Belcampo.com and Anya Fernald is another person you want to follow on social, just absolutely amazing. And just love the quality of their meat, love their mission, this idea of sustainable farming that can be better for the the environment than obviously the non-sustainable farming. So it's pretty cool. They suggest they have a positive carbon rating, meaning like it's a net positive, which is awesome. And I think absolutely attainable for the whole country and the whole world if we focus on it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you accidentally came across that place in the Hudson Yards, because when I was having major FOMO watching you like work out with Arnold in LA last week and then (laughs) check out Belcampo, and then I saw that there was one in New York because I didn't know it was there either because Hudson Yards, this this place you're talking about is, I mean, it's relatively new and people don't go all the way over to the West side unless they really have to. But like, I will absolutely pilgrimage over there to get a steak from those guys. So I'm kind of excited about that. Yeah, do so. And it's totally worth yeah. it, right? So we stayed at the Equinox Hotel just because we were checking it out as far as the decor and some of the amenities and awesome place and just happens to be freezing cold. So we happened to just stroll across the way to this mall and gosh, amazing coincidence. And now I know where it is. I'll definitely be there more often. Sweet. Okay. So I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask you. And we promised each other offline that we would try to like get through a lot of them instead of go on like a lot of crazy tangents. But just one quick crazy tangent, because you haven't really caught up in podcast form and told us about your LA trip. So can you just like quickly tell us how that went? Because it looks really fun. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I had uh, two days out there in in LA with Dr. Huberman, and I don't want to go into too many details out of respect for him, but uh, we have some really, 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 really cool stuff coming in 2020. And we're collaborating on some things, optimizing training and neuroscience and how you can use your training to optimize your brain and ultimately crafting any type of mindset that you desire, right? So we realize that the training that you do, if people don't realize that this, this is important, training is the most neuroplastic time you will experience in your adult life, right? So up to 21, our brains are very plastic, which means it's very receptive to change and learning and adaptation. And after 21, it starts to decline. So training is this amazing opportunity to become more neuroplastic. Anytime you're you're learning a new skill or you're creating muscular challenge, whether it be aerobically or anaerobically, we're creating this modulator. I guess it's a myokine called BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotropic factor, which can effectively allow your brain to change. So you're creating the most of this when you're either learning something to the point where like your brain hurts or you're training really, really hard. So it's myokine released from your muscles. 
Point being, it's this amazing window to change the way you think, the way you look at life, your belief system, your emotions, because now your brain is most receptive to it. So imagine anchoring negative emotions during that time, like, oh, I hate this, or I don't want to do this, or I have anxiety, or I'm angry at myself, or so many people anchor that negative emotion. And I've been talking about this for a while, but Dr. Huberman comes in and goes, hey, man, I hear you talking about this, and here's how we quantify it. Here's what's actually happening. And on top of that, we've created something really cool to make it even more successful and effectively effective for 100% people. And that's the gist of it is collaborating, hopefully, on something that's completely transformative, not only to people in our little community, but around the world. And you know, ultimately, why do people exercise, right? Most people say, we want to have abs. Well, no, you don't. You don't want to have muscle. You want to have what you think muscle will give you. Ultimately, that's just joy and happiness and confidence and fulfillment and better sex and better health. And what if you could have all that without necessarily having to have the end result. And that's the being said, you'll get the end result because you'll be happy about it. You'll have a much better outlook on life. So it'll be much easier, much less of a chore to train hard. You actually, you can anchor the positivity and the joy if you become good at it. So the another podcast we just recorded was with Jacques Taylor, and that one will be out shortly as well. Very, very similar conversation. And Jacques, I hope, will be part of this collaboration as well, this collaborative on ultimately changing the brain. So yeah, that was it. We, we had some amazing workouts, some amazing meals, some great just guy talk, you know, resonated on so many levels and uh, hopefully it manifests soon and on a massive scale. And that's ultimately what we're doing. And ironically, the other podcast that I want to talk about is Dr. Perlmutter. I'm reading his book right now, Brainwash, and there's a beautiful synergy there with all of us. And hopefully we can get him involved in changing the world, right? Changing the scope of the fitness industry, no longer training angry, no longer anchoring these negative emotions and anxiety and fear and realizing you can change all that. And all you have to do is understand the process. So the episode that you're talking about, Andrew Huberman, that's episode 74, if people want to go back and check it out. And I was telling you offline, besides the podcast that I'm on, because I'm a little biased, I think they're the best. That one was one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most recently. Like that one, I literally was sitting there taking notes, Googling while I was listening to the podcast. So that one has been really popular. I can't recommend it highly enough. I think that's really awesome. But I wanted to go back to, you mentioned Dr. Perlmutter, because I know you've got a podcast with him coming up soon. And you also mentioned on, Instagram recently, one of your sort of big 44 principles is reading a chapter a day. What's Dr. Perlmutter's new book about? So again, this is stuff that I kind of talk about in my own little circles and, and I try not to be too much of a conspiracy theorist, but he's basically just quantifying how the world is designed to manipulate our brains. And he gets into the science of it, how it happens, why it happens, and how many levels it's being manipulated on. And the name of the book is Brainwash. And he talks about these environments are contrived, the habits that we create or we think we create ourselves are, are all dictated and contrived. And, and this just starts from the time you're born, right? All the way down to like, hey, you need to eat, feed your kids three times a day or they're going to die. Well, that's a consumerist mentality, right? We're trying to get children to consume. Obviously, when you're a baby, you consume as often as you want to consume. And, and then eventually that disappears. And it's like, hey, you need to eat three square meals a day. And well, why do we do that? Well, they did that because, you know, in, I think it was around the 1860s, they needed to have factory work. You need to have this person being very, very well nourished before they go into work. So, okay, we're going to have one in early morning, we're going to have a little snack midday, and then we're going to eat one hearty meal at the end of the day. And that's just perpetuating this idea of consumerism, right? We want people to consume. And when we start consuming food, that takes us out of our conscious brain and brings us into this idea of primal instincts. And then they drive, television is driving the fear response and the amygdala-based response. And for people that don't know what the amygdala is, described really well in the book, but the amygdala it's kind of this animalistic part of your brain that was the, the earliest part of the brain that is really responsible for the, the animal drive, the instincts, the fight, the freeze, the feed, all these animalistic things that are unconscious. They live very deep in our unconscious brain. And the prefrontal cortex is kind of the thing, instinctively human brain that we can use to control conscious thought. And the amygdala, either you can have the prefrontal cortex habitually overriding the amygdala, or if you constantly reinforce the amygdala, you can have the amygdala overriding the prefrontal cortex which basically means your primal responses, your reaction rather than responding will override. So you end up living this life of, I need something to overcome my fear. I need something to overcome my anxiety because I feel terrible all the time. You know, his thing in the book is this like, this is all, I mean, we've talked about this before, Ash, is this is all design. This is all by design. And we're meant to be outside. We're meant to be in nature. We're meant to have natural sunlight. We're meant to have not television and giving us the news all the time. Uh, we're meant to have food that's not inflammatory, but all these things are literally shutting down your prefrontal cortex, turning on your amygdala into this fear response. And 
This is why I've become such an advocate of breathe, walk, meditate, because those three things are literally the way to shut down your amygdala and anchor and activate the prefrontal cortex and the pathway that kind of overrides the amygdala. So those are your three most foundational necessities as a human being to you know, ultimately optimize your body, optimize your heart and optimize your mind. And you know, there's this beautiful framework that I'm creating for my courses now around mind, so intelligence, heart, which is this idea of sentience, where, where the feeling, and then action, right? Which is the body. And, and so it's so a body, mind, and heart. And this is kind of this framework that I'm teaching in the courses coming up, the coaches course, and how to really get people to understand how to make life-changing transformations. Okay. Can I, related to all of this and Dr. Perlmutter, can I just start like a little bit of shit right now about social media and how something was responded to on social media? Because I just... Okay. I'll I'll tell you. So on the muscle intelligence podcast, Instagram, right? You guys sometimes repost like stuff from previous guests or upcoming guests, like cool stuff that you think is interesting. And I'm looking at it right now. There was a post from Dr. Perlmutter that was basically like, if you're reading this, go outside, go for a walk, talk to somebody, talk to a friend, like have a meaningful conversation, right? Like a pretty innocuous kind of comment about what you were saying. Like we should be doing more like meaningful stuff instead of staring at screens all day. And with all due respect to the muscle intelligence community, because they've been very nice to me and hardly anyone has said anything mean to me. I was really surprised by the responses to that. People were like, you get trolled. No, I didn't get trolled, but the post got trolled. Everybody responded. And I know you don't look at this stuff. It was like, it's cold outside. How am I supposed to call people if I'm not looking at my phone? Like people just really had a defensive response to it. And I'm like, do you defend yourself too much? Yes. Yes. Let's talk about that. Right. (laughs) So if anyone's listening to this podcast, that was one of those people that responded. Well, think about what's happening. All you're doing, your brain, probably by evolutionary design, is designed to look for excuses, things that save energy and to be lazy, right? And so your brain is looking for the problem. Your brain goes, that's a problem. I don't want to do that. Stay here. Be safe. And ultimately, in this society we live in, you don't need to be safe. You need to be active. You need to be moving. You need to anchor positivity. This negative default that we have, it's evolutionarily probably relatively useful, right? Like if I looked at somebody and I could pick out all of the great things about them, but I didn't notice the bad thing they could be someone who's going to hurt me or something that's going to hurt me, right? So it's evolutionary ingrained in your brain. And I see it in my kids. They want to pick out the negative of something. And in that moment, I'm like, hey, tell me three things you can be grateful for about that. And you're just starting to anchor your brain as soon as it happens and go, oh yeah, I see those things now. And eventually it becomes this unconscious habit where rather than seeing the the negative that's always there, you see the positive. And I think it's also very useful to be able to see the negative, but not focus on it, right? So these people who see this post and go, oh, I have to pick up my phone. I want to be a smart ass. <laughs> honestly, fucking check yourself, man. Like it's honestly, you're, it's nobody else around you. And you guarantee that person is not happy with themselves or living this negative pessimistic life and always up other people's ass about, you know, oh yeah, you're, you know, and whatever. I don't want to get into it. But point being, it's you, it's, it's you. It's not a reflect that response is not a reflection of the post, right? Actually, it's a reflection of that person's outlook on the world. And as soon as I learned this, like it's such an empowering thing to come at the world. And I was talking to one of my team members this morning about, and he's had a bit of a conflict with somebody at the gym. And I was like, listen, man, like you don't know where that person's coming at the world. You know what brain state they're at. You don't know what stress they've had in their life today or uh, leaving up to that point. Your only job as a human being is to get better for you. So why don't you see as an opportunity to rise up? And maybe feel a little bit of compassion for that person and go, man, they're probably pretty stressed. They're probably coming from the place of really high amygdala activation. Maybe I can actually do something to make their day better. And even though they're intentionally trying to attack me and offend me, if you ever need my help, I'm here for you. And that's actually how I shifted uh, my online content was people used to troll me, as you can imagine, all the time as a bodybuilder. And my response was always, hey, if you can ever help, let me know. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And as soon as you do that, it takes you out of that amygdala response of getting angry and fearful and wanting to attack and into this place of all I can do is come at the world with love and peace and try to help these people. And that's so simple, right? No matter who it is, if it's your spouse, if it's your children, whatever, it's this idea of let's take a breath and, and increase the gap between the stimulus and response, right? And this comes back to Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. The biggest thing, the biggest opportunity that exists in life is the gap between stimulus and response and learning how to extend that gap, right? So rather than reacting and getting pissed off and getting this huge amygdala-based response and cortisol and adrenaline and getting fiery, learning to just breathe and go, Go, oh, why are they saying this? And you know, what does that say about them? And what does it say about the situation? It probably says very little about me. So, you know, rather than getting into the deep philosophical content, we'll just kind of leave it at that. And nothing that someone else says is a reflection of you. It's always a reflection of them. So it's important to know that. 
I love that. And I mean, again, a lot of these people probably it was, you know, like you said, trying to be kind of a smart ass and trying to be funny. I just thought that I I feel like there's something specific about social media that people tend maybe to take a little bit more personally. You know, there's just like this initial, even when they're joking, defensive, I want to poke at this instead of accepting that like, yeah, maybe I should get off my fucking phone because we're all on it too much, you know? So yeah, people just love to commiserate, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so another question from social media that I've been meaning to ask you for a really long time, and we never get around to it. But since we were kind of talking about neuroplasticity, this has been asked a couple times, and I thought it was really interesting. Folks who listen to your London Real interview, and you mentioned in it that you when you were growing up, you had a either a speech impediment or, or an issue with with speaking to out loud to other people and that you were able to overcome that. Can you talk about it a little bit more like what that was and, and how you worked around it? Yeah, no problem. So it's it gets a little personal, but uh, feel comfortable enough sharing. So from the time I was born, my parents didn't get along and my dad had the most explosive temper you could imagine. So never hit me. But if you could imagine a, a, you know, a child coming home to a house where his dad is literally breaking everything in the house, flipping tables upside down, knocking over counters and dressers and stuff. This is what I walked into often and just screaming and yelling. And so I would just, you know, my sister would kind of lash out and get angry and I would just freeze. I literally didn't know how to move. I was like, what do I do? I wouldn't cry because I knew that it would be deflected on me, tell me to shut up or whatever. So I would just literally freeze. And anytime I walked into the room with my dad, I could feel myself shaking. Like I got so full of fear that that then transferred into anyone who I deemed an authority I would stutter. Anytime I got a little bit nervous, I would stutter. So my brain anchored the association of like this authority or this slight fear, anxiety, stress. Now all of a sudden I start, I start like gasping for air. And so my brain was, well, shit, I, I thought, you know, man, something's wrong with me. Like I have this, this speech impediment and I don't really know what to do. And then I just assumed that's who I was. And when I started to finally grow up and honestly, it wasn't until I was in university that I didn't have that response. So all through high school, I didn't stutter. I just didn't talk a lot. If there was an opportunity to do public speaking, like, no way, I'm out. Play a lot of sports, relatively confident around my friends. But as soon as there was an authority or a coach or a principal, I was either very, very quiet or I stuttered. And so that was all the way up until I was like 19 years old. So again, it was no problem with girlfriends. It was no problem with buddies. It was just like, as soon as I walked into this room with someone who was an authority, my brain went into panic. So once I started to kind of make that association, I remember doing it in university, to be honest. Like I, as soon as I started to make that association of like, oh, this isn't me because I don't do this all the time. So what is it that makes it happen? Well, I started to realize, oh, I just need to learn to control my response to this person. Like, why does this person make me stressed out? Right. So and I, I still do it sometimes. Like I still feel like if I get really stressed or anxious about a situation, I can't access my words. So I feel like often. Right. But it's just I think it's just this ingrained habit that. As soon as I learned to calm down my stress response, my fear response, my anxiety response through breathing and through kind of just having the conversation with myself, like, is there actually a reason to be stressed about this? And if there's not, well, then just let it go. And then I learned I could just speak about it. And if I come into a situation like this or on London Real or on Impact Theory or whatever, Bulletproof, I literally take a few minutes before. And even if it's just 10 seconds now, it's just a few seconds to breathe. And I'm so grateful for that, right? Because it led me to this path of breathing and meditation and calming my fears and exercising also calmed those fears and allowed me to kind of build up the vagal tone of my autonomic nervous system. So this stuff didn't happen as much. So all of those things kind of went hand in hand. So it's, you know, it's exercise hard exercise, it's positive mindset, realizing there's nothing to be afraid of, being grateful, breathing and meditating. Those kind of five anchors for me and being in nature allowed me to develop the vagal tone. So the tone of the vagus nerve and obviously the phrenic nerve as well from the diaphragm and then kind of overcome it. So that's, that's really what it was. And how old were you when you figured this out on your own? You didn't go to somebody or have someone external teach you this because this was happening. You were working through this when you were younger, right? So how did you, how did you take those steps? How did you learn like, this is how I can control my own response and my own actions? how did you figure that out? I think it just became all through high school. It became so infrequent that I started to be able to consciously identify when it happened. Mm. So like I knew if I had a one-on-one meeting with the teacher, like, or if I was getting in trouble, for sure it was happening because I, I automatically get this low level anxiety. Even like sometimes you meet a good looking girl and you're like, <gasps> like I'm all nervous and I just wouldn't say anything. That happens to me all the time. You like I just see a, cute, I see a cute girl at the gym and I just can't, I don't know what to do actually. Yeah. So the reality happened to me when I, when I was in high school and I was like, oh shit. So why is this not happening when I'm talking to my friends or people that I'm comfortable with, but it's happening with people that I'm not, I'm not comfortable with. So it's obviously a fear-based response mm-hmm. where I get a little stressed, I get a little anxious. And all of a sudden my body just starts to go into this like shake. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I see where this came from because I obviously remembered what happened in my childhood. And I was like, well, it must just be an association with 
someone who I deem to be stressful or a situation where I deem to be stressful. So I just started to have that conversation with myself. It's like, why, why am I stressed about this? Like, is this a stressful situation? Is it worthwhile? And if it was, then it would be like, okay, well, fine, let's figure out a way to just calm yourself down. And if it wasn't, then I was able to kind of calm it down pretty easily and then overcome it. So that was it. I mean, I don't remember a specific time, but it was certainly this gradual progression of having happening a lot when I was in grade school, elementary school, and then progressing to much less. As early as like seventh and eighth grade, I was better because I was playing a lot of sports. My health was improving. When I was a kid, I was really unhealthy. I ate like poop. My parents didn't care about my sleep. I always slept with the light on. I usually slept with the TV on. I ate nothing but junk food and sugar. So I could just imagine how inflamed my brain was and my nervous system was a mess. And I was never sleeping correctly. And then so that developed into, oh, this guy's also got a learning disability, right? Did I have a learning disability? No, I didn't. I just had an inflamed brain from literally, and no exaggeration, every single night I slept with the light all the way on and the TV on. I'd wake up in the morning and have a bowl of Captain Crunch. And for lunch, I'd have Jolly Ranchers or something. <laughs> like, it's terrible. And that, that's just all I knew. Dinner was maybe something that my grandma made, but usually it was just kind of whatever. So it's very, very unhealthy. And this is why I'm so maybe neurotic overly sometimes about how I feed my kids because I'm conscious of this inflammation piece. If you read Dr. Promoter's book, Brainwash, this inflammation piece is literally correlated with shutting down the prefrontal cortex, shutting down serotonin, removing emotional regulation, and decreasing your ability to regulate emotions, decreasing your ability to sleep. So God, all these things are so correlated that, I mean, I didn't know that as a kid. I wish I would have had somebody to teach me. So my mission as a dad is to say, hey, even if my kids get angry with me for it, when they're like 12 to 15, they're going to be able to go that I'm so grateful that you didn't let me eat this, this, and this when I was a kid. Because now like life is easy, man. They get good grades. They feel great. They sleep well. They're always happy. Their emotional regulations in place. And like, they're just great little human beings. And they don't know why. Like sometimes they're like, oh, dad, I don't get to do this. I'm like, guys, no, probably not. And I think that's an advantage that right now they get not, they're not happy about all the time, but it certainly will come back and, and they'll likely, hopefully be happy about it. I always think it's incredible. It's almost to the point where it's a cliche now, except it's so just fascinating that a lot of times the things that people struggle with the most become their greatest strengths, right? Like you hear it all the time, but seeing it in practice is so amazing because I'll never forget. I mean, obviously I love this podcast and I love doing it with you and I love hearing your podcast and you're very good at it. But when I went to the first muscle camp in Tampa and I heard you teaching, like actually teaching in front of people, I'm like, holy shit, like this is what you are here for the passion and how good you are at it. Like I knew, I knew you were good at it, but I sitting there in, in front of you and hearing you teach, I was like, shit, like this is what you're really, really good at. Thanks, and that's something that, you know, that's terrifying to people getting up in front, even if you know what you're talking about, even if you're good, that's one of the biggest fears across humanity is speaking and being in front of people and having people look at them. And that's something that you have really, really made a strength in your, in your life and in your career. And it's just impressive when you think about what you overcame to get there, right? But that's, I mean, I think that should be something that people take from this podcast specifically is that when you do struggle with things, that's how you learn and that's how you get better. And I think that's something people should really internalize. First of all, thank you very much. And I don't think I'm great at it yet, but I do appreciate that. I just, I still want to get better. You know, I want to learn to engage and ultimately create action. And that's what it's about. But I believe that's one of our success principles, right? Your greatest obstacle becomes your greatest opportunity for progress. That's one of our, our principles. And also just this idea at the deepest depths of your hardest hour or your hardest set or whatever it happens to be your hardest moment in life, smile because you know you're getting better. And you, so it's funny, I was talking to Huberman about that. He mentioned something that was really interesting. He said, well, that's really interesting that you do that. And I've done that for a long time. And he, and he goes, well, do you know what you're doing when you do that? And I go, no. He goes, well, you're hijacking the dopamine system. I was like, oh, well, well, tell me about that. What does that mean? So, you know, when you start getting to something that's really, 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 really hard, and I, I don't know this from a neuroscience perspective until he told me, but we do something that's really, really, really hard. What happens is your brain starts perceiving stress. So cortisol starts to elevate. Eventually, noradrenaline, norepinephrine kicks in. And norepinephrine can only be elevated for a certain amount of time before you reach massive fatigue, right? Your body just shuts down. And so your body can have elevated cortisol, but it can't have elevated norepinephrine for a long time. So it'll just shut down. And norepinephrine seems to be the thing that shuts people down when you're doing really hard sprint or, or you know, whatever. Like it'll shut down this, your ability to perform this exercise. So he goes, what you're doing is by smiling, you're anchoring a positive state. You're anchoring the reward system. You're releasing dopamine in your brain. And your brain, dopamine has the ability to knock down that noradrenaline. And I was like, Wow, that's amazing. So you know, empowering people to know that like when something sucks and you have the conscious awareness enough to smile 
and realize, oh, this is so good. This is where I'm getting bigger. This is that we're getting better. This is my step up the proverbial mountain, right? This is the last few steps before the, you know, the finish line. And I'm getting this reward. And all, you're getting that reward before it happens. And now I can actually shut down and maybe do more work and maybe anchor this positive state rather than having this negative association with, wow, that was really hard and that sucked. I don't want to do that again. Your brain goes, fuck yeah, give me more. That felt amazing. And it's literally just a matter of shifting the perspective. And again, this is part of what we're anchoring in our, our little collaboration together. But that's super interesting. And I, he quantified it for me. And I was like, man, well, thank you. I didn't know why it was the case, but I knew it made a big difference for me. So going back to the, you were talking about inflammation and kids and what they eat and how they sleep and lifestyle. And I wanted to ask you about when your kids become teenagers, and we've talked about the circadian rhythm thing and how it's it's actually fact, something we always thought about how teenagers want to stay up all night and sleep late. And that's just what teens do. But there's actually like a circadian rhythm explanation for that, that, that teenagers need a different kind of, like they need more sleep. They need sleep that tends to happen later and you, they wake up later. And that is not conducive with the way we set up our teenagers' days in North America, right? So do you have any thoughts for that? Like if your kids are going to be in a typical school, so maybe some are homeschooled, but if they aren't, how do you work around a schedule that is literally set up for teenagers to feel like shit and be tired and not sleep properly? Well, there's something in what you said right there. It's like everyone listening to this podcast, if you have young children or you have children that are under the age of 10, start creating a plan in your life to homeschool, right? Like the sooner you can get out of the box, man. And I know that sounds like I'm pushing people things and I don't often do that, but and I'm so vehemently against the box and, and I don't want to get into too much details about what that shit is, but just this indoctrination into the factory worker mentality, right? Show up, stand in line, eat what you said, put your hand up, don't speak. And that's literally the, the factory worker mentality. There's books written about this, right? Start Like I said, 1860 was kind of that magic time where it sort of started to happen where they, needed, they realized big corporations needed people to work in the factories and they need people to buy the stuff that they made in the factory. So they started to just anchor from a young age, like, hey, this is what these kids need to learn. You eat when you're told to, speak when you're told to, go to the bathroom when you're told to, other than that, keep your mouth shut. To us, you know, some people who've gone through the school system, you're like, well, that's just the way it is. And you're like, well, fuck no, like that's not the way it's meant to be. Why? And, you know, then you're just conforming into this box that the government and, and all these higher level authorities want you to stay in so you don't ever create things outside of the box. And again, not to get into the conspiracy stuff, but it's just this idea of if you can, like, and even if you think you can't, like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to make that happen. Good. Make a plan, right? If you need to save, I don't know, $20,000 a year, fucking figure it out. Figure out how you're going to do it. If it's going to be an extra $20,000 a year for you to homeschool your kids, start saving now, right? Figure out a way to work your ass off between now and then. And, and just the idea of that breaks you out of the box, right? Oh, I'm working a nine to five and I don't know how I'm going to make more money. Good. Figure it out, right? Don't ask me how to do it. Ask yourself how to do it, right? Work your ass off and feel fine. You start making decisions and start making good, you're kind of pointing yourself in the right direction when it comes to actually making these things materialize. And again, not everyone will be able to make it happen, but I think we should create this community around like, hey, I'm going to get outside of the box. I want to change the scope of the human race. I want to change the scope of you know, people having to conform to all this nonsense that's been just thrown on us, these belief systems that we must apply. So again, that's one step. The next step is if you have to have your child in school or maybe your child's already in school, you got to get them to bed earlier. I mean, you just have to. I mean, getting eight, nine to 10 hours of sleep is almost a must. I mean, I still have a 13-year-old son at home, a stepson, and he's getting 10 hours every night, usually nine in bed, nine o'clock is his bedtime. And sometimes I'll let that slide like 9.15, but like seven o'clock he's up. So he's getting, you know, that good 10 hours. And that's a good, I think that's a good amount of time for his brain to actually grow. And does he want to go to bed at nine? Of course not, but that's just not an option, right? And, and the thing parents do that's a huge mistake is letting it slide once. Because as soon as you let that thin end of the wedge in the door, they're like, oh, you know, mom and dad say it's okay with this one time you're screwed, including everything, like brushing your teeth or eating the breakfast or anything. Like you have to be scheduled and regimented so that your child can succeed. As soon as you allow, like it's it's just like getting up in the morning to cardio. As soon as you go, well, uh, you're, you're not going to, you're going to go, right? As soon as you're 99% in, you fail. You have to be a hundred percent or nothing. And so this idea of like, Hey, we're in bed by eight, my younger children, or we're up by 645 and we eat breakfast and we go over, go for a walk when they're at school. Like all these things are just things we do. It's not, uh, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do, we don't. Because humans are lazy. You're, you're designed to be lazy. You have to create the habits that are just anchored. It's very easy to get up and not meditate. It's not even a fucking option. Just get up and do it and make that just like, that's my routine. It's like getting up, I breathe, I walk, I meditate. That's it, right? That's just the way it needs to be. And the same thing with your children. Just get up. People say to me like, hey, I have a hard time getting my kids to brush their teeth. 
well, why do they even have an option to not brush their teeth? It's just every day, go and do this. It's, it becomes mindless. Like before my kids are allowed to put water or food in their mouth, they must brush and floss their teeth. Oh, well, how do they do that? I, I don't know. They just do it when they get up. I don't have to tell them anymore. You know, it's the same with making your bed. Just make your bed, right? Don't think about it. One of the things that you and I talk about the most that we 100% are on the same page with is being open-minded about knowing that there is no rule that's set out for you and for your life and for your career, no matter how many outside forces are telling you that like this is the trajectory you have to take to fit in and to be normal, that you can always explore different ideas and different ways of doing things and ask the question, well, why? Like if someone's telling you, you have to have this kind of job or you have to sit in an office or you have to work out this way, just ask the question, why? And I've tried to live my life that way as much as I can. And I remember just really recently having a conversation with a super successful functional medicine doctor friend of mine. She's a young woman who focuses on women and she does telemedicine. So all of her interactions are, are done like online. And she was she lives on the West Coast. And I was talking about how great New York is and how she has to come here and hang out with me. And she's like, you know, I've, I've always wanted to just kind of like live in New York or see what it's like and how it feels, but I'm over here and whatever. And I'm like, dude, you do telemedicine, get an Airbnb, come here for a month, live here, work here, just like you were in California and see how it feels. Just live here. Like literally what is stopping you? You have no children. You have no reason to be stuck in one place just do it. And this is a super intelligent, successful, high functioning woman. She just never thought about it. She was just like, oh yeah, shit, I guess, I guess I could do that. And now she's super pumped. She's going to come here in the spring and spend a month. We're probably going to hang out. But like, she just never thought, okay, well, I guess I could like, what's, what's stopping me. Right. And I think that just sort of the reminder, like you said, every day you're journaling every day, you're working out every day, you're taking care of yourself. Like every day, just think about what you could be doing to live the life that you want to do and step, like you said, step outside of that box a little bit. It doesn't have to be as epic as moving across the country for a month just to see it, but something like that, why not? Why can't you do it? I think that's the kind of attitude that more people need to take into every area of their life. I mean, it's going to make you happier and live a life that's more true to what you want. And it's not that scary once you do it, right? You just have to take the step and try it. Yeah, I think that's where journaling comes in, this ability to reflect. Like, did I do everything today to live my highest and best? What did I do today that wasn't my highest and best? Am, am I actually living in a place in an environment that's conducive to me actually being able to do that? What's the single thing today I could do that would make the greatest impact in the world, the greatest impact in my business, the greatest impact on my family? Now, those are the questions you have to ask. And like, did I do them? Did I live in harmony with my values and my integrity? And like simple questions like that, if you reflect on those daily, you can certainly massively shift how you look at the world, right? And people, again, I'm not always perfect with this, but like taking some time to reflect on today. So usually when I'm in bed, I'll sit down and I'll write or I'll reflect and just think about what do I do today or what just getting back from this LA trip and then this New York trip is like, well, what did I do during those times and reflect on what did I learn? You know, who did I impact? How is this moving me closer to my big mission? Do I have clarity on my big mission, which most people don't? Mine is honestly maybe 80% of the way there. Like I know that I want to impact people to change their lives and change their body and their mind. And this beautiful integration with Dr. Huberman, I think is an amazing step in the right direction. And then I'm just kind of open to what comes. I know that I love teaching and love connecting with people. And I want to be a huge part of shifting the entire fitness industry, which is unfortunately, my belief is that we do way too many things unconsciously. And that's, I start in the fitness industry because that's my closest demographic, but I know that trickles into every demographic. But like, how do we start with, with the people that are closest to us and make the greatest impact on them to maybe just live a little more consciously, be a little more happy, be a little more connected with your true nature, your true uh, dharma, right? This idea of like your true essence. So that's maybe my mission is, is helping the world connect and using my platform to just let people smile, man, and feel joy. And it's funny because, you know, the book of the week this week, guys, for the listeners is Dr. Perlmutter's Brainwash book. And I couldn't put a higher recommendation on this book. I absolutely love it. But one of the things he writes about in the beginning of the book, in the introduction, he has a little statement, like a little paragraph. And it almost seems like he's trying to make it seem like the ideal mindset to wake up in the morning and take with you into the day. And like, what would life be like if your mind worked like this? And this is going to sound bold, but I kind of feel like that's what my brain works like. It's like the way he wrote it is just like, man, imagine everything was just positive and, and you were moving in the right direction. You're helping people and you woke up and you're grateful. And like, fuck, I, like looking back 10 years, if you would have told me that I would wake up in the morning and I would say, yes, that's my brain, I would have laughed. Like there's no way, but I really feel like certainly I have still have stress and I'm grateful for my stress. Right. And it lets me show that I'm getting better at something. But the brain he wrote about this ideal mindset he wrote about, I think is pretty damn close to what I'm doing now. Again, there's certainly things in my life to that I need to improve on. There's certainly things I want to get better at. But for the most part, 23 hours of the day, if not more, 
very, very pleasantly surprised maybe or, or grateful for this mindset that I've managed to create. And I want to take that and get, let's, how do we bottle this, right? Take it to the rest of the world. And that's really what Dr. Huberman and I are going to do in 2020, starting in 2020. This is a fun question that I actually like to reflect on as well, since I'm also in this podcast world. But the question is, what is something that you have learned over the past year, specifically throughout the podcast, like through your work with the podcast? What's something you've learned about yourself or that you've learned career-wise and taken into your work just from doing the podcast? I'll tell you what, a really big realization I've had in the last couple of weeks is no matter how strong you think you are mentally, you're still vulnerable, susceptible to the manipulations of social media, the manipulations of materialism. I'm still very, very susceptible to it. So I'm pretty good with not using my phone. I'm pretty good with not kind of getting on social media and being mindless about things. But I found myself mindlessly scrolling a few times. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, and, and you just, you pick up your phone, you do it, you pick up your phone, you do it. And I've even done it in the morning some days. So I'm like, what am I doing? Why is that happening? And you realize it's this unconscious quest for dopamine, right? So if you feel a little off or you realize like, hey, so this is the way I, I explain this to people. It's like right now I have a resting default tone in my body. It's a fee just an overall feeling tone that I get. So my body feels like, I don't know, maybe it feels at peace. Maybe it feels a little bit of tension in my head, maybe a little tension in my chest, maybe a little tension in my stomach, wherever you hold your tension, you feel that. And that's kind of your resting default tone. And, and everyone has that kind of resting default. And now if I can do anything in my life that changes that and makes it even 1% better, my brain goes, oh, well, that felt better than this resting default tone. So let's do that again, right? So we're literally training your brain to go after this thing again. And you're like, even if it's the smallest degree better, your brain creates a positive association. This reward system anchors it, this dopamine response. And, oh, well, now I'm going to do more of that. It's completely unconscious. You are not in control of that. Like, so no matter how disciplined and strong you think you are, you must remove these things from your life as a habit. Don't put your phone in the bedroom. Don't put your phone anywhere near you when you're doing meetings or work or because it's almost impossible to not. And if you're sitting there staring at your phone, fighting yourself to not pick it up, well, there you go. That's a big, big issue because unconsciously, that's that's just another level of stress that's running. And it's like, it's like the you know the spinning beach ball of death running on your computer. You're like, ah, why does this have too many programs open? Well, that's happening. And I think to me that was a really big realization because I always kind of be like, oh, I'm, I'm pretty mentally strong, and I, you know, I, I can I can leave it there and not look at it. And sometimes I test myself on that, but just the fact that it's there. Your brain is aware. So I'm, I'm now changing habits in my life to where it doesn't come in the gym with me unless it's absolutely necessary. If I'm filming or something, fine. And, you know, it's not coming into podcast room. It's certainly not coming into work room. It's, I'm going to not use it at home with my kids. I found myself scrolling at home with my kids. I never used to do that. And I don't think I'm addicted to it. I just think if it's there, you know, if you're sitting, this is a very good example. If you're sitting in my house, Ash, and, you know, we're having a great conversation. Somebody walks in with a plate of freshly baked cookies. Oh, I was just going to go there. I was just going to go there. Right. You go, oh, yeah, 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 I'd like one of those. Like your kids walk in, you go, oh yeah, I'd love one of those. You weren't thinking about that before. Like you didn't think about cookies, but as soon as somebody walks in the room with cookies, like, oh yes, I'd like to have one. Yes. Same thing with your phone, right? If, if it's not there, you're like, oh, I'm not thinking about my phone. But as soon as it's in front of you, it's like that freshly baked cookie. You're like, oh, that would be so nice right now. You're like, yeah. So right. So as soon as I bring it into your into your mind, that's and so this is what kind of phone companies are, you know, any type of app is building their business around. It's like our unconscious desire to just feel a little bit better. And then all of a sudden it's anchored into your habit of Oh, that made me feel a lot better than this other state I've had. So to give people a hack, when you are feeling that negative default tone or that tone that maybe is a little bit off or a little bit anxious, breathing is always right there. Taking a slightly more peripheral view of life, like not focus on something, pan out your eyes, or go outside. And those things will all bring down that feeling tone, that high sympathetic tone, that slight cortisol, slight stress, anxiety feeling and bring it down. The longer you breathe and the more often you do it, the quicker you'll be able to get out of it. I appreciate too that you mentioned that that this is something that you noticed signed, sort of creeping up and you nipped it in the bud quickly because I think a lot of the sort of type A people that probably listen to this podcast are thinking, I have really good willpower or I'm really disciplined and so I should be able to override this. And knowing that there's, there's a chemical thing going on, it's not necessarily just about some people being weak-willed and some people not. If 
someone like you, like they're thinking you would probably never struggle with any of this kind of bullshit. And everybody does, because like you said, it's like these things are created for us to be distracted by. Anybody who's dieted for a show or done anything like that knows that it's not because you're weak or lazy or weaker than someone else that you want a cookie when you haven't had one and it's suddenly placed in front of you. It's about being mindful about creating an environment where these things don't even have to be a decision that you have to make. I think that it's, I just, yeah, I appreciate you kind of being honest about that because I think a lot of people would think that some people struggle with it and some people don't, and that's just it. Sure. And I think the reason you wouldn't struggle with it, one, maybe it's just not something you create a positive association with, or maybe your goal, your long-term goal is much bigger than the short-term reward. Again, coming back to Dr. Perlmutter's book, he does a really, really good job describing what's happening there, this balance between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. But on that, Ash, we're going we're gonna to wrap up this podcast just based on time, and we're going to give a shout out to our amazing friends over at Bubs. And I've been using Bubs Collagen and MCT for gosh, 18 months now, I tell people like, hey guys, you need to try this stuff just like the olive oil. Like you need to try this stuff because it's actually better than everything else on the market. And I don't know why, I don't know how it's different, but it tastes better. It dissolves better. It's just better texture, but like it's just better. So our friends at Bubs have been so gracious to offer us a discount for our listeners and create a relationship with them as of you, Ash. And they're just wonderful people with an amazing cause. 10% of their profits going back into charity, which is super, super challenging to do as a business owner. Like you know, some of these businesses barely run on 20% profit. I'm not sure how they can afford to give 10% back, but- Because their products are so good, they're crushing it. That's literally why like it's, totally. it's super impressive. Yeah. Like I don't think there's any other company. I mean, maybe we could double check, but there are not too many companies companies giving 10% to a, a charity. It's super impressive. So because you're awesome listeners of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast and we love you, we, you can use code intelligence at bubsnaturals.com. Head over and use that and get the MCT and the collagen. I promise you're going to love it. It's worth it. Dissolves. You know, I, I think I've shown a video of this stuff dissolving into cold brew without having to even blend it. It just stirs mm-hmm. in nice. It's awesome. And the collagen is amazing. So my breakfast every day, quote unquote breakfast, I put one scoop of Bub's Collagen, two scoops of Bub's MCT, a little bit of Lion's Mane, a little bit of Alpha GBC into my blender. I blend it for about two seconds. It's fluffy. It's like an awesome latte. I throw it into my mug and I'm, that's my kind of way to kick off my day every day. We call that the intelligence coffee and Bub's is a huge part of that. So head over to bubsnaturals.com, use the code intelligence and get hooked up because they're awesome. You're awesome. Everybody, Ash, I appreciate you very much. I'm going to wrap up because we are on a tight schedule, but everybody have an amazing day. If you did enjoy this podcast, please head over to iTunes and subscribe if you're not already, because that does drive the podcast. I would love if you guys could leave us a review and ideally share with at least one person you know and love. And again, don't forget to go back and listen to my podcast with Dr. Huberman because it was incredible. And I can't wait to hear from you guys on iTunes and social. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.